Facebook has been under fire for years for the social media giant's hard stance on freedom of expression. Civil rights groups have routinely complained that face about Facebook's harboring of hate speech, which violates its own policies. And in light of recent news about Facebook, the company hired civil rights auditors to examine its policies. This is what the auditors found. In a, re in a report released earlier this week, they call Facebook policies a, quote, tremendous setback that have undermined civil rights progress. The auditors also suggested that Facebook create a civil rights infrastructure consisting of managers and top-level executives based on the report. Also, they want Facebook to analyze how the platform foments white supremacy beyond banning buzzwords and images. Joining us to discuss is Abari A. Williams, who formerly served as counsel for Facebook. Ms. Williams, this is very disturbing a uh, report from these auditors. Do you believe that Facebook was aware of this already before the audit? Yes. Um, I think it's much akin to, uh, Facebook was actually sued by Ben Carson in 2019. Um, that's probably the only time I will, I will give props to Ben Carson for anything because of the, the platform's ability to only show certain housing to certain demographics. So if I have an apartment for rent, I could therefore go in and say, I only want to show it to black women between the ages of 25 and 40. So that's blatant housing discrimination and you can't do that. <laughs> so if you can get away with that for years, and then also we had Cambridge Analytica and we've had all kinds of hate speech that has happened on the platform, including things that were happening in Myanmar that were not taken down. So they've been aware of not just issues around black Americans and civil rights, but they've been uh, they've been made aware about issues globally for years. It's not new. What what is the incentive for the company to keep this uh, information up to not block it, to not do a better job of patrolling it? What is their financial incentive to keep it? Growth. So one thing that um, and when I when I heard the the woman, uh, I can't remember her name, but the, the whistleblower that came out with the Facebook papers, mm -hmm. I, as soon as I heard what she was saying, I completely believed it. And it is a focus on growth and growth means engagement. The longer you stay on the platform, the higher the numbers, the more likely you are to click on the ads. The more ads you click on, the more the advertisers will buy. So it's a, it's a, a vicious kind of little cycle. But the goal is it's hyper growth and it is a financial model that um, seemingly worked for a while until I would say towards the end of last year. Um, but then of course this year, particularly this month, it's been like a trickle, trickle, trickle of something bad every week. Um, and I could go on about that in terms of how this new name change to Meta is really just a distraction. So it's like, don't pay attention to you know, civil rights violations, don't pay attention to misinformation on our platform. And we gave, you know, cover for people to organize uh, for the insurrection or, you know, don't don't think about how Instagram actually the engagement where, where teen girls are actually getting eating disorders because they stay on the platform so long because we keep showing them negative content. So it's like, look over there. Now we changed our name. So but you could change your name. But if you're not changing your policies and you're not really doing anything different. So does any of this open Facebook up to litigation of any sort? If, if they know that they are causing harm, but internally they're making the, 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 the profit decision to not change the course that is causing the harm, are they open to litigation? Well, that's a good question. I would say, honestly, I, I, I don't think any civil litigation would come from it. The, the biggest thing that we probably will see in the next couple of years or so will be regulation from the federal government. And you already have regulation from state by state with different privacy policies, um, which is going to cause, I think, uh, a, a world of trouble for other types of platforms as well. But I think more, more often than not, what you're likely to see, you're going to see regulation, particularly around the type of content that they can be liable for under the federal government. They're going to have to come up with some type of regulation for this because it's not just Facebook. It's also, you know, it's also... Google and Twitter and right. TikTok. And so 
everyone's going to have to kind of feel the heat on that. But I think definitely you will see some type of federal regulation coming soon. That's actually probably the only thing I see bipartisan agreement on. Historically, when, when newspapers were facing the, the prospect of heavy regulation, they got together uh, and, and self-regulated. They, they came up with a, a, a kind of a list of criteria around newspaper publishing that satisfied the federal government and made them not move forward with heavy regulation. Is there any scenario in which the big tech companies, including fe Facebook, might get together and realize either we do something or people in Washington who probably really don't know what we're doing, you know, have really a good understanding of social media, are going to get together and they're going to do it. Do you believe that that could happen with, with big tech? I do. I think that that's actually probably something that um, if they haven't already considered it or if it's not already even works. But I definitely think that that's something that they all have in common. So you have all your social media um, and then throw Google in there as well. I would say they definitely would want to come up with their own regulation before one that they don't like is put upon them. And what I think um, would be smart is to really kind of sit and think, what are the rules that you want to, what are the rules of the road? And we all have to abide by them. And so the problem is that you also have to regulate the consortium together. And we'll see if that is something that, that they can get together and would actually want to do. I imagine that also would be hard to do in terms of like actual implementation. But I think coming up with a set of rules, like a, let's call it a, you know, social media bill of rights, if that's what they could all come together to do. And then they, they present that to the government and say, this is what we've agreed upon. If you will just rubber stamp it, we can all be on our way. What do you think could be some regulations that could work in this space to remedy some of these problems? Well, I think, um, one, I think if you, if you are aware of something that is harmful internally within the company, I would say to a certain extent it should be, if, particularly if you're going to rule by consortium, that should be something that you bring to the consortium, and that should be something that they should help decide. But I do think that we need to have better content moderation um, and you need to make sure the algorithms are not just pumping negative information because that provides your high growth in terms of engagement. And the reason why they do that is because if you show me something that's talking about the election and maybe I'm on the opposite side of that, I'm going to get angry. And anger is the emotion that actually fuels more engagement. It's not, you know, a happy cat video. You're going to scroll past that. So I think if, if people are, are really honest about the algorithms that they're using and they self-modulate and regulate, if, and particularly if they do it in a consortium, to ensure that, hey, we're all making sure that we're only hitting, let's set a percentage of this is only the percentage of negative content we can show in a timeline at a time. That would be e extremely helpful. You know, the... The Russians and maybe some other people, the Russians for sure use social media platforms like Facebook to influence the 2016 election. What the federal government has, sh has told us and shown us is that they have never truly stopped. Do you believe that Facebook is doing enough to make sure that people are not using its platform to tamper with American elections? Um, I, I would say... Yes and no. And I, I would say, yes, I, I honestly do believe that they do the best that they can with what they have, where they are. But I think the other problem is thinking about the, the vast amount of users you're dealing with, you know, over 2 billion users on, on just Facebook. That's not even counting what's happening on Instagram and, and what people are doing on WhatsApp. So, but you have to think about it from the standpoint of if you only have I think maybe 20,000 content moderators and they're spread out in different jurisdictions around the globe. Well, also the issue around that is certain people, like if you're, if, if you are judging the content of Americans and you live in, you know, Indonesia, you're not necessarily going to have the cultural cues perhaps to understand what the nuances are in our election system. So that's right. something else. Well, I would also say that a lot of the content moderation should be in country as much as possible, particularly if it's going to have to do with elections where, you know, you cannot take foreign money. You just simply can't. But that would also have right. to apply across right. the board in, in every other country that they operate in.
Bari A. Williams, thank you so much for joining me tonight. Really appreciate it.